Welcome to Lakefield United Church. My name is Linda Unruh. I'm chair of the coordinating committee, and I just want to bring you up to date on a few things that have been happening in the church that maybe you're not aware of. In the Advent season, our minister, Reverend Carrie Perry, had to go on restorative leave, and we do pray for her speedy recovery. Uh, just before Christmas, we closed the church to in-church services, and we did not have a service at Christmas time. I do hope that you had, uh, were able to reach, um, be with your family and friends over Christmas in some manner, whether it was online or inside or outside or even in your garage. And I have heard it said that some women want to keep the tradition of, of Christmas in the garage just so that they get that garage cleaned up once a year. And I think that'd be a really good idea. December 31st was the last day of the Lakefield Youngs Point pastoral charge, and we pray that each church has a happy future uh, going their single ways. January 1st, a part-time minister, Reverend Brian Ransom, has started working for Lakefield United Church. Uh, he will do, be doing urgent pastoral care, Sunday services, and a few meetings. He's from Ontario, around Fitzroy. He grew up in Ontario and went to school here. He became an ordained minister in 1985 and for 36 years, mostly worked in central Ontario. He was uh, involved in the Presbytery and the uh, conference. He was president of Toronto Conference in 2015 and 16. He's been involved in Indigenous studies and truth and reconciliation, food banks, he likes biking. He lo loves his grandchildren. He and his wife live in Bowmanville. And he's been working in Peterborough before at Emmanuel. And he was very well liked there. And they say we're lucky to have him. So I would like to, on behalf of you, the congregation, and the board, to welcome Reverend Brian Ransom. So welcome, and I thank Linda for introducing me. Friends, uh, whatever has happened this week in your life, um, know that God is with you and offering you peace, rest, and blessing. Welcome to this place that we call sanctuary. Let us light the Christ candle. There once was a person who said such amazing things and did such incredible things that people began to follow him, and they followed him. He would teach them the way of God. As they listened to him, they wondered, and so they would ask him questions. One time, they asked him, who are you? And he answered, I am the light of the world. So for those who have the service bulletin, I invite you to join me in the call to worship and in the opening prayer. We are marked as God's beloved ones. What have we done to deserve God's love? God's love is God's free gift to us, always and forever, even when we are being difficult and turning away from God. God's love never vanishes from us. Thanks be to God, who is ever faithful to us. Amen. Join me in the opening prayer. Creator of all that is and all that will be, we come to you from our various places of living to be a, to be a community in your name. Let your spirit gather all of who we are to be one in spirit as we lift up our celebrations and praise for you. Let these moments of worshiping together equip us to be your body, serving your creation with the compassion and love of Christ. Amen. 
And now I invite you to turn, if you have your hymn book handy, from Voices United 380, She Comes Sailing on the Wind. Our scripture readings are from, the first one is from the Hebrew text, the Old Testament, Isaiah 43, one to seven. And the second is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter three, 15 to 22. Let us listen 
for God's spirit through these words as printed in scripture. From Isaiah 43, one to seven. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. I give people in return for you, nation in exchange for your life. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will, says, I will say to the north, give them up and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. From the New Testament, from the Gospel of Luke, let us listen to these words. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winning fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat in, into, into his greenery. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod the ruler who had been rebuked by him because of Herodus, his brother's wife, and because all of all the evil things that Herod had done added them all by shutting up John in prison. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Amen. Over the centuries, dissertations and articles and volumes of books have been written to give the searchers who seek to seek out insights in addressing this mysterious question of who is Jesus. The entry made by Luke as to who Jesus is is an introspective reflection made by him many years after Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River. The revelation informs the reader who Jesus is through an experience that Jesus had when he prayed. When Jesus saw the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descend upon him in bodily form like a dove, a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus's identity is shared with us by Luke, but still Jesus's identity is not fully revealed. It remains a mystery that confounds us to no end, sending us to the insights of others to confirm or to deny our desired understanding of who Jesus is. We are inquisitive people, are we not? 
We want to know who such and such is in the spheres we journey in as it was with Jesus' day. Let's make this a little bit more personal. If I were to ask you, who do you think you are? How would you express your presence to me? You might begin by informing me of your position in life, in the world. Maybe you're a farmer or an educator or a tradesperson, a stay-at-home parent, a manager, a business owner, or maybe you're retired. Or maybe you would share your personal family connections as a father, a mother, a son, daughter, your family background, your grandchildren, whether you're single, in a relationship, or married, etc. Or maybe you might begin by sharing your heritage. Maybe you're Scottish or Danish, Irish, indigenous. Maybe you'll declare where your roots come from, from India or Middle East or Japan, Britain, US or some other place. Or maybe you might begin to share your brokenness, your failed marriage, a school dropout, an addict, unemployed, disabled, and so forth. In my experience, most often, many individuals define themselves either by their brokenness or their pride as a result of their positions they hold in life. These are the typical ways in which a person informs others about themselves, about their identity. John the Baptist, in this brief scriptural snapshot, is trying to define who Jesus is to those who are asking. Many are asking John if he was the Messiah. Notice how quickly John takes on the sub, sub, subservient role here, clarifying his position with and to Jesus by saying, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming, whose sandals I am not unworthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John does not set out the theological arguments as to why he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. He only points to the mystery of what the Spirit will bring through Jesus' ministry. Who Jesus is moves people from just turning towards this creator as captured in John's baptism a baptism for the forgiveness of sins, moving the person from away from themselves to God. But when Jesus' presence hits the water, the mystery of the Spirit is set into motion. There was no turning back from what John had said. Turning back from what you ask? No turning back from Jesus' identity here, which ultimately reveals our identity. When Jesus was in prayer after his baptism, he encountered a vision, as told by Luke. A remarkable event happened. The heavens opened. I've altered this passage a little just to make my point here. The sky was rolled back, and the mystery of heaven was revealed to Jesus. When the heavens opened, all the boundaries on earth could not hide from the presence of God in creation. In other words, there are no boundaries on earth where the spirit of the creator's revelation cannot be seen. That mystery I speak of is shared through the words of Isaiah as he gives the people of Israel hope who have been in exile for many decades. 
Isaiah speaks of Yahweh's prom- promise of old and their return to Israel. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold them. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This declaration in Isaiah's time informs us of who we are. For, for, it, will bring, for it brings the offspring, as it says in Isaiah, from east, west, north, and south. Daughters and sons from all the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed for myself. So the mystery for us is to recognize oneself as being part of this proclamation. Throughout the Old Testament, the slaves of Egypt were led by Moses to the freedom, were reminded constantly that they were God's people. We are reminded from the very book of Torah of the Old Testament to, through to the New Testament. In the book of Genesis, right through to the end of Revelation, that we are all declared as God's people. As spoken of in in Genesis 17. Once you were no people, now you are my people. Peter proclaimed this in 1 Peter to the early movement called the New Way. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellences of God who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. You once were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. And to the book of Revelations, chapter 23, it declares, And I heard a loud voice from the throng saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with humanity. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. There are more than 60 passages throughout the Bible that directly reaffirms our identity with many other references as stated this over and over again that all of creations is Yahweh, and that includes you, I, and all of humanity. But in our description of our identity to others, guess what? We fail to give breath to who we really are. As I wrote my bio and sent it to Linda, I did exactly the same thing. I failed to give breath give the spirit of who I was, about my true identity. Jesus declares who the woman in Luke 13 is. A woman that was bent over for 18 years is seen as a burden by her own community. Jesus sees her differently when challenged for healing her on the Sabbath. Jesus replies, should not this woman a daughter of Abraham, be set free on the Sabbath day for what bounds her? Or the hemorrhaging woman deemed unclean, made an outcast and marginalized because of her illness, as spoken of in Luke 8. We hear Jesus call her as God sees her. Daughter, your faith has made you well. So Jesus points out in both cases the fact that All of Abraham's offspring are Yahweh's sons and daughters. The healer was reminding the crowds that one is loved and accepted by Yahweh unconditionally. There's nothing that bars us from being the the creator's offspring. As with Jesus' baptism, we do not discover the whole of this new identity all at once. It comes to us unexpectedly over time. 
like Jesus discovered his bap- at his baptism, at the Canaan wedding feast, the desert experience, and so forth, the mystery of the Holy Spirit he saw. In the Christian denomination, to claim one's identity and faith as a Christian is a public affirmation by baptism of our relationship with the Holy Other through Christ. But baptism, in many respects, is the public sign, but it's really not necessary. In spite of our differences in people's faith stance and theological position, all are expressed in Genesis as created by God, in God's spirit, as offspring of Abraham. Now imagine if we would truly acknowledge our identity and all of creation created in God's spirit first, do you think it would change how we relate to one another and creation? Would the world be a different place? Would the mystery of God be spoken of in places where it has been barred from? Would the mystery of love, compassion, mercy, kindness we hoped for and proclaimed throughout the Christmas season be the rule instead of of an afterthought? Would our global communities be buoyed up, not just by the power of human ingenuity, but also by the gift of Yahweh's hope for creation and humanity? Where the mystery of God becomes unleashed in the world is when you and I accept and live into our genetic identity, placing it at the forefront of how we pull back these earthly boundaries as Yahweh did with the heavens, revealing God's mystery in community. The more we live out our identity, the deeper our relation with the Creator is formed and the more of the mystery is revealed. When we declare that we are a child of God first, what are we declaring then? We are declaring our identity. In what we do and say is for the purpose of lifting up creation and one another in a positive way, announcing God's presence. It calls us to build up the body of Christ in creation. It changes our perspective, seeing creation not as ours or a planet or our planet as for our own pleasure, but as the creator intended it to be the Garden of Eden for all, to be respected and cared for by you and I. With our identity, it shifts our, cell, our, it shifts our focus from ourself, and our energy is given towards not our self-interest, but to the mystery of God's love and how that is worked out in creation. Archbishop Tutu, who died a week ago last, this past Sunday, said, we are not loved because we are good. We are good because we are loved. That's our identity. We are made in the mystery of God's love, born to do good to love one another as God loves us. This is the intent. This is the inherent trait that flows from our identity. So who do you say you are? Tell me about your identity. Think about what has been shared with you over over the Christmas season. An epiphany awaits you as you move through this new year. As you let the spirit of the living God roll back the sky, be prepared to further discover your true identity. Claim your identity, not as the world would have you, but as the creator desires you to do so. Once claimed, it will be easier to see the presence of the creator in all of creation. Once the sky is rolled back, we then can listen more intently to the maker's declaration, you are my beloved, amen.
Let us join our hearts as we pray for one another and for our world around us. Holy creative energy, your essence is everywhere. It is your energy that gives us life and being. Your energy that gives all of humanity the ability to love one another, and by so doing, discovering how much you love us. The world we have been born into is not perfect. During this time, we have global catastrophes of every kind happening around us, floods that have destroyed communities and crops. Our prayers are with the people of BC, Indonesia, and other places that are experiencing such catastrophes. Let our ears be open to how we might respond to the needs of those who find themselves in crisis because of the environment. We are aware of the 20 million people who have been displaced by environmental disasters and civil unrest around the world. Many of these individuals are seeking refuge for a safer environment. Many people are fleeing from their homes, taking extraordinary risks, crossing territories and waterways that are not safe, risking life and family for a better way. Enable the world to be more attuned to them and their condition that they face. Help those who assist them to do so with compassion and the understanding of Christ. Creator as, as, creator as the Omicron virus rages through towns and cities, creating anxiety and frustration and separation among loved ones and friends, we pray for those who are infected. And for us to encourage one another to put others first in these difficult circumstances, that are draining our spirits of patience and hope. Your spirit, Holy One, claims us as yours. Help us to hear that good news and to remember those we are in conflict with, that they too are loved by you. Our appearances, our goals, and our faith may be different, but we are all united by the one who created us. As we face these differences, spirit of the living one, aid us to remember that your spirit flows through each of us, calling upon us to treat one another with, with a dignity and respect. So here are our prayers for our community, for those whom we love and hold dearly in our thoughts. Hear them by name as we lift them up before you. Holy One, we also pray for this pastoral charge and the stress that has between the relationship of the, between Young's Point and, and Lakefield United Church, that they have agreed to part ways and to seek out their own direction. Be with them both as they struggle to find what it is that is in store for them now. Let our actions shine now in how we seek reconciliation with one another, with the people of this land, how we seek out justice and peace, enabling the community to live in unity by furthering the human rights of those who struggle to be accepted and to live a life in safety. 
in this place we have gathered in your name. Let your spirit guide each one of us to open ourselves to your way, to your words of love and compassion, to your direction. Hear our prayers for ourselves. Remind us, Holy One, that we are your sons and daughters. We are brother and sister to one another. In Christ's name we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for trespassing and trespass against others as we Forgive those who trespass against others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
So let us go in the name of the Holy One to live out our calling to bring mercy, hope, and love to all of creation. Let us go in the name of the one who loves us to live out the ministry of Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let us go with God's blessing. Let us go from this place seeking ways for harmony and peace to prosper. Amen.